live in a volatile, uncertain world where product life cycles are shrinking, tech changes are accelerating and geopolitical pressures are building. This mix has made what has often been called a solitary job even more challenging. I'm talking about the CEO of the 21st century. As per McKinsey Research, the average CEO tenure in the US has decreased from 10 years to less than 7 years. Leaders today have to not just deliver on shareholder returns, but also steer their organizations through an era of changing regulations, disruptions in supply chains and distribution networks, fast-paced digitization, heightened public scrutiny and social media activism. So what does the job of a CEO entail today? And is there a value pattern that separates the good CEOs from the very best. I've often wondered about the so-called CO effect and it was revelatory to me to see these questions being answered by a team at McKinsey in their best-selling book, CEO Excellence. Now the book attempts to codify the winning mindsets of some of the world's best CEOs. Leaders who've led large public companies for at least six years and more and delivered excess total return to shareholders. So, what are these six mindsets that McKinsey believes differentiates the best leaders of the 21st century from the rest? And more importantly, what do they achieve? In the words of the authors, these mindsets enable them to navigate the dominant features of their environment. That's new competition, disruptive change, digitization, pressing social and environmental issues or economic meltdowns with wild success while others wallow in mediocrity. Well, the, uh, the process had uh, perhaps had three parts to it. Part number one was we at McKinsey obviously do a lot of our own research on uh, CEOs and uh, uh, CEO excellence, on, on uh, CXO leadership, on board excellence. And so we had a lot of facts and figures and data uh, to kind of really hint at what great CEOs do and, you know, what are the things that, uh, you see from an output point of view from, from great CEOs. But we felt a book on that would be pretty boring. So the second step was to really identify some terrific CEOs to go interview. Uh, we started out with roughly 3,500 CEOs who've been CEOs over the last 25 years. We narrowed that down by putting on two criteria. One, we wanted to talk to CEOs who'd been enrolled for at least six years. And secondly, we wanted CEOs who had de delivered, call it top 20% shareholder returns. We made a few exceptions to get geographic and other forms of diversity in the pool, but that narrowed the group down to about 200 CEOs. We were fortunate to reach out to about 75 of them and 67 of them said yes. And so that then led to the third part of the uh, process, which was to interview these CEOs in a fairly structured way around topics like strategy and organization and leadership and teams and their own operating model. And it was out of these, the stru these structured interviews that these six mindsets emerged. So this got us thinking, could we turn the lens on Indian companies and CEOs and put together a playbook for outperformance or excellence? Of course, there is no one size fits all solution, but as McKinsey's research shows, there are common values that best CEOs exhibit, which guide them in their decision making. So we got down to identifying high performing CEOs based on some very specific criteria. So how did we go about shortlisting and identifying these excellent CEOs? Well, we mirrored the global framework that was used in the CEO excellence book largely starting with the companies that deliver top quintile, top 20% of TRS performance in their respective industries. Uh, using that, we came out with a short list of CEO names, and then we applied a filter of at least a five-year tenure. Uh, and this tenure ensured that uh, this, there was a longevity to institution building as well, in addition to just the operational and financial goals that they were able to deliver. Uh, that gave us a set of 20 CEOs. Uh, and then we added, uh, in the interest of diversity, we added three more archetypes of CEOs, a few public sector uh, CEO leaders, a few women leaders, and also the unicorn leaders. Uh, and that collectively gave us uh, an excellent and diverse class of 25 CEOs. 
Well, with the shortlist of the CEOs done, the actual work began. As the philosopher Goethe said, boldness has genius, power and magic in it. And CEOs that have made the maximum impact are the ones who haven't been afraid to make big bets. As for McKinsey's research, an analysis of 3,925 of global companies over an eight-year period points to five big strategic moves that yield the highest probability of jumping from an average performer to a top profit generator. Now, these include decisions to buy or sell assets or businesses, invest in differentiation, improve productivity and strategic capital allocation. One of the key winning mindsets that high performing CEOs share is their ability to reframe the rules of the game or draw out a fresh vision board for the company which changes the metrics of success. Like what Ajay Banga did at Mastercard when he brought in a strategic shift, pivoting the company away from focusing on growing the electronic commerce market which accounted for just 15% of transactions at that point to prioritizing going after 85% of the market that operated in cash. Kill cash became the new strategic vision which then drove decision making. The, the Ajay Banga example from MasterCard is one of my favorites. Uh, he came in in 2011. Uh, by the way, MasterCard was $17 billion in, mas uh, in market cap when he took it, took it over. When he stepped down, it was north of $300 billion in market cap. So quite the journey. But one of the things he observed was that everyone in the organization was talking about beat Visa, beat American Express. And he looked around and back in 2011, 85% of all consumer transactions was still in cash. And so he came up with a two-word vision, two-word vision, which was kill cash, kill cash. And that gave the organization all kinds of permission to go and build payment technologies that would go after the cash opportunity, to really go after debit card uh, volume, which were at lower margins than credit card volumes, but nevertheless, very profitable, have done well. And it just opened up the aperture at MasterCard for a whole different set of uh, set of things that could be done. Like Ajay Banga, Reed Hastings did something similar at Netflix. Now, instead of focusing on being the number one DVD company in the United States, Hastings dreamt of creating a global entertainment distribution company, which today boasts of video streaming, original content, and a decisive global footprint. You know, I didn't really set out to be an entrepreneur. There was and I, some ideas that I was excited about. And you taught I, geometry and algebra as well, I believe. Yeah, that's right. I was a high school math teacher. Um, and so it was some ideas that I got so excited about that I had to build a company to see the idea through. Mm. So I think if you start with the idea first and the company um, second, uh, that's probably a good approach. Well, the great thing about the Netflix culture is it's always improving. Um, we're trying to get better. And one of the ways that we're getting better is being more global. So everything from how we schedule meetings to how we write up results so people can read them you know, at different times, because now we're operating around the world. So we don't look at it as, let's take the California culture mm. and make sure that that's the same culture around the world. We want our culture to get better, to be more reflective of the whole world. And every time we open in a country, every time we get great employees to join from around the world, you know, we adjust the culture and we try to learn from them some of the great lessons. So what is the framework for creating a game-changing vision? Finding and amplifying intersections, making it about more than just money, not being afraid to look back and forward, involving a broad group of leaders in the process, making big moves early and often. The best CEOs make bold strategic moves early and often during their tenure. Like what Satya Nadella did when he took over Microsoft in 2014 and helped steer it back to relevance and high performance. Big acquisitions like LinkedIn and GitHub, doubling down the company's focus and investments in the cloud business, moving towards online subscription model, cutting losses in the mobile phone business by exiting the market. These strategic choices made by Nadella catapulted Microsoft back to the top of the pecking order. Like if I look back, right, Microsoft was created when Paul and Bill sort of created the uh, basic interpreter for the Altair. Uh, very recently, in fact, we were talking about and marking some big milestones mm. in quantum computing. What did we do? We, in fact, launched a new language 
for quantum algorithms. We put a simulator in Azure mm. so that developers can now start learning quantum. So I felt that even at the cloud, we can be the ones who can democratize AI, democratize AI infrastructure, uh, so that developers can be successful. So that to your mind is the soul of Microsoft, democratization of technology. Correct, because in some sense, our, the soul of Microsoft is we create technology so that others can go on to create more technology mm. or achieve more success because of what they have been able to do with our products. We're that ultimate platform and tool creator uh, whether it's Minecraft or whether it's Word mm. or Visual Basic or Visual Tools or, or Azure, to me they're all things that allow others to create more technology. How do you encourage a spirit of competitiveness without combativeness or aggression? Right. So I've always grown up in the Microsoft that knew how to both cooperate and compete. Mm. And I wanted to bring those both back. I mean, there are some battles that are zero sum. You know, we compete against Amazon and AWS, but at the same time, we're happy to bring Cortana to Alexa. To use Satya Nadella as an example, as he was shifting the mindset and the culture at Microsoft from one of, I am the smartest person in the room, to one that was around, centered around a growth mindset, that required really hard work in terms of defining the metrics, the measurements, the, uh, the communications, the role modeling, ultimately the incentives to make that happen. And so for three years, Satya talked about nothing but growth mindset, growth mindset, growth mindset at Microsoft to really kind of move the organization. So what are the attributes that make a great CEO? And why do great CEOs have to be exceptional futurists? We're back after this short break on this special broadcast with the answers to that question. Welcome back to The Winning Mindset, The CEO Guidebook. So what are the attributes of the best CEOs? Well, they are exceptional futurists. They keep an eye on the downside. They act like an owner, applying hard paddles to create a series of performing enhancing S-curves. You have to reinvent yourself because the world is changing and so you have to change as well. Not everyone sees all the things that you see, all of those pieces together. And there's actual work in being that integrator who sees all those pieces, who recognizes the interdependencies across your strategy, your board, your investor expectations, your organization, and is also looking forward to the future. And that's a big part of the CEO's job is not just keeping the business running, but thinking about where it's gonna go next and thinking about these series of S-curves for the company of where it's going into the future. I think Hubert Jolie was a great example of that at Best Buy, right? He walked into almost a turnaround situation, but he saw the multiple steps that were gonna get them to a position of strength. So the first phase was all around, you know, turnaround and cost cutting and earning the right to go further. Then the next phase started to reframe and rebuild the relationships with the vendors and position them for growth. And then he went ahead and really you know, redesigned what it looks like to be an electronics retailer at the intersection of, of physical and online and, and delivering a customer experience. He was the one looking ahead of where we needed to go while also focusing his company on delivering what they needed to do now. So it is a juggling act, right? These six aspects of the role that we talk about and your job is to keep all of those pieces happening. I think our, our co-author, Scott Keller, talks about it as being a decathlete. Right? You need to be in the top 20 in the world in all six sports at the same time. And, and that's part of the challenge of the role. In fact, one of the other distinct mindsets that high-performing CEOs share is their ability to think like an outsider when it comes to resource allocation. 83% of CEOs believe that capital allocation is a key lever for growth. McKinsey's research shows that high-performing companies reallocate more than 6% of their capital from year to year versus a large majority that reallocates just 1%. The difference, the data suggests, means a CEO isn't constrained by legacy or tradition and is willing to take a long-term view rather than be boxed in by short-term pressures. So, to codify the key takeaways, start with a zero base. 
solve for the whole rather than parts. Manage by milestones, not annual budgets, and kill as much as you create. There were two or three things that struck me, though, as we talked with these excellent CEOs. The first was their North Star in terms of their overall vision for the company and where they wanted to take it from a strategic point of view at a very macro level, uh, never really shifts over their tenure, right? You may need to adjust it year to year, the environment shifts, the challenges shift. You may have to adjust your tactics, your strategic tactics in terms of acquisitions or product segments strategies or customer segment strategies, but they don't waver from their perspective in terms of the overall vision of where the organization needs to go. So that's number one. And number two, they really recognize that to shift leg legacy organizations and to move it in, in a more, in a direction which allows them to really go focus on an audacious vision, typically requires very significant culture change. And so they focus a lot on this mindset that we talk about when it comes to aligning the organization, which is treat the soft stuff as a hard stuff. They recognize that this, these things that we call the soft stuff, culture, talent, organizational alignment, is actually really, really hard work. Uh, they all buy into this old saying by Peter Drucker that culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. So they put a lot of time and energy into that. In a connected and volatile world, as organizations grow and scale, they need to come to terms with building in flexibility while also ensuring stability. McKinsey's research shows that organizations that work on creating an environment that enable agility but without sacrificing on stability are three times more likely to be high performing than those that are agile but lack stability and four times more likely to be high performing than those that are stable but lack agility and hence the importance of stability. The, the CEO of today has to deal with a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty, particularly around speed, number one, newer and current challenges like inflation and geopolitics, number two, and three, some new challenges that will be relevant for many years to come, like sustainability uh, going forward. And in my mind, the, the, the timeless messages of the mindsets will remain but they will need to adjust on the tactics. They will need to adjust on the tactics of strategy, right? How are you really being bold? How are you uh, modifying your strategies in the context of a year or two, uh, but not necessarily in the context of a five or 10 year horizon? As a CEO, I tell you, I've, I, I'm, I'm finding that I have to become a learning CEO. I have to go to school all the time because I'm learning uh, new skills that I need to run this company and I'm realizing that I'm not equipped to uh, just coast. I have to constantly renew my skills. But more importantly, I have to surround myself with people who can help the company power through these VUCA times. What are we looking for? We're looking for leaders who are extremely agile, who can go from you know, geopolitical calm to geopolitical uh, crisis, from commodity volatility of, you know, where commodity prices collapse one day to another time when commodity prices are at an all-time high. In the volatile world that we have, priorities do change. You know, it's interesting. At the top, priorities change more often. As you go down the organization, you have to anchor some priorities because if everything changes for large portions of people, they cannot handle the volatility. And the top three levels of the company are critical. Those levels, You've got to teach them to insulate the rest of the organization from wild swings, but work with the CEO on the volatility. Uh, in volatile times, it's more important you're out there, you're visible, you show that you're in charge, and that you're confident. Well, that is the former CEO of Pepsi, Indra Nui, and as we just heard from her, the best CEOs stop the pendulum from swinging wildly. They also emphasize accountability, and that is crucial. They also think helix and not matrix. And of course, they make smart choices. I think a CEO of today embodies the mindsets that we've been talking about. 
right? The boldness of ambition that is expected of them, but also that is is they're capable of in their organizations. I think there's a recognition that this job is too big for one individual leader. So you have to mobilize your team. You have to manage the psychology of your leadership team so that you're all driving towards the same goal. You can't put your head in the sand as in terms of your stakeholders. So the amount of engagement with your board, with the other stakeholders is a core part of the role. And so CEOs today are CEOs of the world, right? And they're, they're learning constantly from what's going on around them. They're bringing that into their organizations. They're mobilizing people towards really extraordinary goals. And it's an exciting opportunity. It's difficult, but those who are doing it well can accomplish terrific things for all the stakeholders that they're managing. Best CEOs focus on functions and role first and then find the right people to fill them. Now, talent management should be driven by identifying the most important jobs, defining the skills, attributes and experience needed and then starting the search process. Here's how the best CEOs make the right people decisions. They define what are the high value roles. They don't forget the left tackles and they find the unusual suspects and ensure that you actively build a bench. It's really important to recognize that great CEOs care deeply about talent. They recognize that without talent, they are not going to get very far. Uh, we asked an open-ended question to many of our CEOs, which was simply, what is your single biggest regret? And remember, this question is being asked of incredibly uh, 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 successful CEOs. And nine out of 10 of them gave some version of, I didn't move fast enough on talent. I didn't move fast enough on talent. Each story was a little different, but by and large, the big message was, move quickly on talent. When you recognize talent gaps, when you recognize things aren't working on your team or in other parts of the organization, move quickly on talent. We anchor too often on building a team of stars. We want a whole series of A players, a lot of them who are great at what they do. But one of the things we heard loud and clear from these great CEOs was it's not about a team of stars, it's about a star team. How do you get away from the mentality of a team of stars and really build a star team where the team is working collaboratively and really well together? James Gorman, the CEO of, uh, of Morgan Stanley said to us, Focus in on the two C's when you pick a team. Uh, the first C is for capabilities, and the second C is for collaborativeness. And you want to have both in your team and in your leaders that are working for you. So what we've attempted to do are decode some of the ground rules for the CEO guidebook. In our next episode, we turn the spotlight on our first high-performing CEO and continue this pursuit for CEO excellence. From all of us here on the CNBC TV 18 team, thanks very much for watching and don't forget to tune in.